Goroman Borisovich Yagoda. The spelling of those years has been preserved after the death of Menzinsky. Graham Graham Yagoda became the head of the secret communist police. Contemporary Russia is essentially ruled by two men, the dictator Stalin and his police minister, Yagoda. There is no exaggeration in this. Both, with some caveat, resemble the figures of Napoleon and Fouch. The reservation is that, just as an Asian, Stalin is a caricature of Napoleon, so Yagoda is a caricature of Fouch. But monographs are dedicated to Stalin and Yagoda remains in complete shadow. The civilized world does not even know this paramount figure of the Kremlin, the main pillar of the communist dictatorship, and she deserves attention. First of all, Yagoda is bloody like none of the Czechists. In his bloodiness, of course, he surpassed Joseph Fouch a hundred times. In moral baseness, Yagoda argues with him. But in terms of intellectual level, Yagoda is only suitable as a lackey for the famous Jacobin, the winner of the Emperor Napoleon and the Minister of Louis XVIII. The relationship between Stalin and Yagoda will one day be the most interesting chapter in the behind-the-scenes history of the Russian Revolution. They say that Yagoda hates Stalin and trembles before him just as he trembled and hated Napoleon Fouch. But Yagoda, of course, will never beat Stalin, even if Stalin has his own Waterloo. This blood-drenched man, who emerged from the darkness of the KGB basements, is too insignificant to play an independent role. That is why Stalin will never destroy Yagoda. Barry's power is limitless. This is well known to the citizens of the USSR, who have the hand of the Minister of the Communist Police on their throats. And even better this power is known to the Communists, on whose throat lies the same thickly bloodstained hand of Yagoda. Who is he? This Kremlin nobleman. Where did you come to the chair of the Minister of Police? Where did the Bolshevik Revolution find for its panopticon this figure with a sallow, deathly pale face, with a piece of mustache above the lip, and stupid, crazy eyes? Just as dignitaries who were elevated to the nobility once had coats of arms and genealogies written in drawn genealogical trees, so now Kremlin biographers composed glorious revolutionary biographies for communist nobles. Composed, of course for Yagoda. But it was probably too difficult for a chief security officer to compose a revolutionary biography, because until October Yagoda had no biography, not only revolutionary, but no biography at all. He probably did not even notice his own landlady. But October made this non-entity, the minister of the communist republic. But we will try, at least somewhat, to thin out the biographical fog around Yagoda. His real name is Yagoda, and the full name of the all-powerful minister of the secret police is Heinrich Grigoryevich. He is Jewish by nationality. The main specialty is a pharmacist. Born in 1890 inches a small town of the Kingdom of Poland, in a poor family, was the only son among many daughters. But while the sisters of the future Czechs somehow made their way, studying for copper pennies in the capitals, the beloved son Heinrich was not capable of any teaching. He was a stupid, gloomy loser, of whom the Jewish proverb says, if they start selling hats, people from this day will be born without heads, if they think about selling boots, people will be born without legs. And Yagoda's parents sighed with joy when the future minister by hook or by crook passed the exam for the title of apothecary student and entered a small Nizhny Novgorod pharmacy. There was nothing characteristic about the pharmacist Yagoda. Not quick. Not lazy, not smart, not stupid. Rolled pills, made drops, prepared medicines for the sick who came. The most ordinary little man, in a white coat, a pharmacist of a small pharmacy. But in the soul of this little man, those who knew him note the following traits. The pharmacist was cunning, unusually bestially embittered and, like a loser, pathologically envious of everything. Young Yagoda could be brought into a state of painful irritation by any good thing of another, a colorful tie, yellow shoes, expensive cufflinks. Probably, in the early 900s in Nizhny Novgorod, it was precisely this feature that pushed the pharmacist into the revolutionary underground. In those years, there was a Bolshevik cell in Nizhny Novgorod, headed by the well-known, future chairman of the All-Russian Central Executive Committee, Yakov Sverdlov. It was into Sverdlov's orbit that the pharmacist of a small pharmacy, the future minister of police Yagoda, devoured by vicious envy for everything in the world, plunged into Sverdlov's orbit. Sverdlov baptized him with the first revolutionary baptism. During the day, an inconspicuous, unpleasant-looking, bilious pharmacist needed ointments for people in porcelain cups, scattered powders on pieces of paper, and in the evenings ran to the safe house. But even in Sverdlov, this young man, 
pretending to be obliging and devoted, caused nothing but irritation, he was unsuitable in everything that Sverdlov did not entrust him with. Besides, the pharmacist suffered from a complete lack of pathos, he was unusually cowardly. Where, in fact, does pathos come from? Yagoda did not go into the revolution like Sofia Porovskaya, sacrificing himself for the Russian people. The pharmacist went out to fight for ties, for yellow shoes, for cufflinks, for the very life that he saw out of the corner of his eye in Nizhny Novgorod, but not in a dirty safe house, but with a remarkable revolutionary and then ruler of thoughts, with a writer Maxim Gorky. Yagoda ran into Gorky's apartment from Sverdlov. There was no natural enthusiasm in the cunning, tough, envious young man, but, of course, Yagoda also pretended to be enchanted by the power of the spirit of the author of the petrol. After many years, fate smiled disgustingly at the world writer Gorky. Falling into morbid insanity, tearfulness and complete lack of will in old age, the author of The Song of the Falcon fell into complete dependence on the cunning pharmacist who once hounded his doorsteps, who became Stalin's minister. The pharmacist subtly seized the ruler of thoughts into his hands offering to throw out the old nonsense about the falcons and petrols from his head, and instead write enthusiastically about communist concentration camps. And the old man Gorky, alas, fulfilled this order. Cleverness, cunning, spitefulness, permissiveness, subservience, swindle and blood, blood without end, that's what brought the pharmacist Yagoda to the ministers. He is not Rivera, not Stormy, like Jerzinski, he is not subtle, not sophisticated, like Menzinski. He is uncultured, he cannot pronounce two words coherently. No one sees him anywhere and he does not perform anywhere. But it was on him for the concentration camps, for the punitive expeditions, for all sorts of Belomorstoy, that all the hatred of the country was concentrated. During the 18 years of Yagoda's work, the blood that he poured into the Shika and the GPU was varied. Yagoda killed everyone, aristocrats, intellectuals, bourgeois, peasants, workers, monarchists, cadets, socialist revolutionaries, Mensheviks and even Trotskyists. People who know Yagoda say that the pale man with hysterical eyes is unusually cowardly. There is nothing surprising here. In the history of the revolution, the most terrible people are cowards who have seized on great power. And nothing sheds blood like cowardice mixed with fear of retribution. Fouch, the mastermind behind the Lions Massacre, by the way, was also cowardly. To the historical gallery of cowardly terrorists it is necessary to add one more, the pharmacist Yagoda. If, by the time of the October Revolution, the pharmacist, who was in a hurry to power, had had some other data to play some role in the revolution, he might have taken other paths. But Yagoda is a greedy zero. And realizing that on the way to satiety and power, all doors were closed to him, except for one, the most terrible, but also the most profitable, the Shika. He, grabbing the jacket of Sverdlov, who had become a nobleman, rushed through this door. Under any system, marriage is always the surest means of a political career, and the pharmacist Yagoda celebrated his October wedding with the niece of the chairman of the All-Russian Central Executive Committee, Sverdlov. And Sverdlov recommended his relative to Jerzinski for KGB work. But, alas, Jerzinski, who slept on a folding bunk and ate horse meat, did not like Yagoda who was trying to reach power. Yagoda realized that with this ascetic it was difficult to make a career and quickly ran to another already promoted Czechist, the head of the special department Menzinski. In the pools of blood for the thirsty life Yagoda, this sick, characterless degenerative shadow of a man became an excellent springboard to a great career. In the heat of the special department operating in the front line, Yagoda finally felt at the target. True, the special department is the most terrible, bloodiest department of the Shika. People captured by the special section go only to death. Black crows of the special department take people away only to be shot. Cells of the special department only death cells. Even the names of those arrested by the special department are not known to anyone, except for Czechist officials of the special department. But someone else's blood never bothered the pharmacist. Under Menzinski, Yagoda immediately went uphill. First he is his secretary, then his deputy. In addition, the place turned out to be warm not only from excessively shedding blood. Under the half-dead leadership, more devoted to aesthetic emotions, Yagoda immediately seized the entire vast economic part of the Shika. It is known that Czechists took bribes, stole, even killed people in order to seize money and jewelry. What was only one part of the economy of the Shika, 
A member of the Collegium of the Sheikha Drugov tells well, in the Sheikha room, the cabinets were bursting with gold taken during the raids. The gold in our vault was piled up like firewood. It was this economy that the pharmacist Yagoda seized into his hands. His love for the household, and especially for someone else's, is also noted by his former employee, security officer Agabkov. The pharmacist Yagoda furnished his office in the special department smartly, according to his own taste, generic ladies' satin furniture with rims, Rococo style. Well, at one time Yagoda prepared a sufficient amount of powders, pills, drops, ointments, now he wants to live. He carefully puts the sick Menzinski into the car, carefully wraps the broken, jerking legs of the authorities in a blanket, and sits sideways at the helm. This deadly pale man with evil eyes is already the actual head of the special department. He signs hundreds of death sentences to all those who once sat on pink furniture, wore golden shoulder straps and walked down the street, not noticing him. The pharmacist Yagoda. This is class struggle. Mercy. Generic Yagoda does not know what mercy is. Fouch, who made a splash all over the world with the murder of 2,000 people in Lyon, is a child compared to the pharmacist Yagoda. However, Yagoda's cruelty is helped by sadistic inclinations, about which his same former employee of the Czechist Agabkov tells point blank. To show how cruel and bloody Yagoda was in the special department, one does not even need to point to the hecatombs of those he shot. It suffices to point to such an episode when in February 1920, trying to wash off the blood at least a little before Europe, the Council of People's Commissars abolished the death penalty on the territory of the entire republic. With the exception of the front line, Yagoda from the special department sent the following business telegram to all the provincial Shika, in view of the abolition death penalty, we propose that all persons who, for various crimes attributed to them, are subject to capital punishment, be sent to the zone of hostilities, as to a place where the decree on the abolition of the death penalty does not apply. And the Czechists, in hundreds, thousands, brought the arrested to the front line to Yagoda where he shot them on a legal basis. Yagoda understood that as a non-entity, he would only come to the Kremlin chairs through pools of blood. And he walked to these chairs knee-deep in blood. In 1922-23 Lenin noticed Yagoda. In these years, the special department, this is Yagoda. No one except Yagoda knows all the secrets of the bloodshed here, the whole bloody dirty kitchen of the secret communist police. And at that moment, when Jerzynski handed over the post of head of the Sheikha to the shadow of a man to Menzinski, behind the back of a semi-paralyzed degenerate, Yagoda clearly felt his power. By alleys, back doors, intrigues, flattery, merciless bloodshed, he is now moving further, to the complete sole leadership of the entire secret communist police. Menzinski's back is an excellent screen for Yagoda, but the path to sole power is still not easy. Behind Menzinski's back, Quite near the high-ranking chairs, Yagoda suddenly collided with another dangerous opponent, Menzinski's second deputy, Trilliser. A frail dwarf, with a short-cropped gray head, Czechus Trilliser was dangerous to Yagoda because he was educated, smart, belongs to the old guard, has a biography and is strong in connections at the top, while, behind the death of Sverdlov, Yagoda there were no more personal connections at court. Behind the paralyzed back of Menzinski. A dull and desperate battle began between the leaders of the bloody department. But Yagoda, inferior to Trilliser in everything, had its own advantages. No one shed such an amount of blood as Yagoda. Barry grew up on blood. Besides, he brilliantly masters the skill of intrigue. And from the struggle with Trilliser, Yagoda emerged victorious, lying in wait for his opponent at a critical moment in the palace squabble between the Trotskyists and the Stalinists. They say that Yagoda himself sympathized much more with Trotsky than with Stalin, but seeing clearly that the pie of power was already in the strong hands of a Georgian who went ahead and not Trotsky, who rushed about, Yagoda instantly ran over to Stalin, hooking Trilliser precisely on sympathy for Trotskyism. In 1929, he red-handed Trilliser in providing an office to a meeting of representatives of the district committee, infected with oppositionism. This is already a sure step towards the death of Trilliser and the omnipotence of Yagoda. The caricature of Fouch runs to the Kremlin to the caricature of Napoleon, and Trilliser, a member of the Collegium who once had enormous power, falls from his chair. But Stalin furnishes this fall with dramatic details, 
unexpected even for Yagoda. The dictator is a great master of these Asian subtleties. All Makuyushniks and gangsters know what cements the blood the most. Desiring to keep the GPU firmly in his hands and in order not only to catch Triblesser in Trotskyism, but also to take Yagoda as his final dog, Stalin decided to give all three main leaders of the GPU a sip of Trotskyist blood. The fate of the captured secret envoy of Trotsky, the former left senior Blyumkin, the dictator put on the decision of the board of the GPU, Menzinsky, Trilliser, Yagoda. The calculation is correct. All three knew that Stalin had already decided the fate of Blyumkin, that there would be an execution. But Stalin wants to see how the noble Czechists will behave when, after the blood of officers, intellectuals, bourgeois, peasants, workers, the dictator brings them a little more Trotskyist blood. Stalin had no doubts about Menzinsky and Yagoda. But Trilliser and what a seasoned Czechist, really, got excited. Trilliser even dared to say that he did not want this blood, that he was against the execution of Blumkin. Stalin and Yagoda were waiting for such a wavering. Following Menzinsky, Yagoda took a full gulp of Trotskyist blood, speaking in favor of execution, realizing that in this gulp there was not only the physical death of Blumkin, but also the departmental death of Trilliser, which Yagoda needed. Blumkin was shot. Stalin is satisfied. Trilliser, who had been slurping, was removed from his post, and Yagoda, who drank Trotskyist blood, is Stalin's most faithful dog, who will now sip this communist blood as much as the dictator requires. In 1930, Yagoda was in fact already the sole head of the secret police, and in 1934, the People's Commissar of Internal Affairs. No matter what decorations are built around the GPU for internal party purposes, or in order to please Europe, no matter what new figureheads are appointed, as long as Stalin is alive, the sovereign minister of the communist police will be a terrible caricature of Fouch, a livid pharmacist with stupid hysterical look. The blood-drenched Kremlin caricatures are inseparable, they perfectly understand each other. The power of Yagoda, the head of the secret police, is enormous. Yagoda can play a lot on the GPU instrument, but the dictator is calm. Yagoda shares power with Stalin. Although, plucking precisely this string, the Czechist competitors of Yagoda try to knock down the brutal and greedy pharmacist. I tried to grab Yagoda by the hand, it was, the most bloody honored Czechist, the second deputy chairman of the GPU Messing, the head of the Moscow Shika in its most terrible times, that Messing who was beaten by Vershilov for recruiting the Red Marshal's mistress into secret employees, and that Messing, who was shot at in the Leningrad GPU by a member of the Komsomol Truba. They say that in 1931, in the Politburo, Messing said that he is horrified when he sees the specific amount of power concentrated in the hands of one person. No one in the world has such power. But Messing probably underestimated the collusion between the dictator and the police minister. Yagoda's power remained unshaken. Managing the gigantic apparatus of the secret police, in which the former police practice merged with the azephism of the former underground, Yagoda now became the most significant figure in the domestic and foreign policy of the USSR. In a greenish house on Lubyanka, behind a door with a glass plate special department in an office now furnished not with ladies' pink furniture, but finished in the latest constructive style, with club chairs and a set of telephone handsets, without sleep and rest is the head of the secret communist police. The police formula says, information is everything and from all over the world. A gigantic flow of information is pouring into Yagoda's office from the grandiose army of GPU agents. The cunning pharmacist made a career. He is the confessor of the whole country. In the office, everything is sorted, filtered personally by him, the head of espionage and reprisals against the dictator Stalin. His system of provocation reached the level of monstrosity. The spy system is fantastic. We readily believe the stories of fugitive security officers that Yagoda in an intimate circle loves to show off the exact plan of the private apartment of the head of the intelligence service and can tell the most intimate details of the personal lives of many European statesmen. In the network of foreign agents of the GPU, led by Yagoda, there are, of course, Many of the most incredible, perhaps even the most fantastic, agents. They say that the former pathological malice and envy of the pharmacist has not been eliminated. The head of the secret communist police hates with particular hatred the Russian emigration, that is, those officers, intellectuals, monarchists, cadets, socialist revolutionaries, Mensheviks, whom he did not finish shooting in the front line. And how demonically thin the work of Yagoda's agents in combating emigration is. Even if the famous trust organized by him, 
which Yagoda personally led and whose secret agents he lured V.V. Shulgin to Russia, and not only him. They say that under the guise of a member of the trust Yagoda personally saw Shulgin in Russia, as if he himself corrected the manuscript of his book about this trip and released Shulgin only in order to play a new, even more demonic game, to lure the head of the ROVS general, who was trying to start a terrorist struggle Kudipova. True, no one is safe from contingencies and orange peels, even Yagoda. Such a crust turned up in his game and the trust turned out to be exposed. But Yagoda nevertheless reached out to Kutpov with the hands of his agents, and Kutpov disappeared in broad daylight. Yagoda is not shy about distance. Of course, in the darkness of provocative work, Yagoda also has major defeats. Partners playing with Yagoda are no more stupid than him. Yagoda's biggest trouble was the activity of a man called Ilksei Koner, exposed in 1932, when Yagoda established that a member of the All-Russian Central Executive Committee, a communist dignitary, a Kremlin nobleman, Deputy People's Commissar of Agriculture, Comrade Koner, was not at all Koner, and not a comrade, and not a communist, but a secret agent of a foreign state. They say that it was Yagoda who accidentally called Koner, who had just returned home from the Kremlin. What are you doing, Koner? I'm having lunch. That's it. It's a small matter. Don't let the car go. Stop by the GPU for half an hour. And when, in the afternoon, an unsuspecting secret agent of a foreign state, he is also a comrade of the minister, a nobleman of the USSR, who easily enters Stalin, Connor arrived at Yagoda's Lubyanka office, the latter, inviting him to sit down, suddenly called Connor his real name. At the GPU in trance, the driver waited for Connor for an hour, two, three. Comrade minister did not come out, and the driver stood waited until the host came out and shouted, Who are you waiting for? Comrade Kunner. Well, okay, go home, you won't wait. In his vestia, Yagoda reported on the execution of Kunner as a pest. But an agent of a foreign state, who worked in the Communist Party since 1920 and rose to a ministerial post, Kunner, probably experienced extraordinary torture at the hands of Yagoda who interrogated him. The power of a person with a deathly pale face and dull eyes is terrible, huge and uncontrollable. There is something to fear here. If desired, even a dictator would not have escaped Yagoda, just as Napoleon did not escape Fauch's investigation. It would seem that in our time of a rapid change of many state decorations, at the turn of the Russian Revolution, this bloody figure of a pharmacist could flash by. But, no. Stalin is holding his minister trembling before the dictator by the collar. In addition, Stalin is well aware that this insignificant personality has no data to play an independent political role, and according to his biography, Yagoda is so bloody that he causes repulsion and disgust even in the communists. That is why Yagoda cannot be moved anywhere from the KGB post. Everyone shied away from the gloomy stupid pharmacist. Even the masters of the bloody workshop flung and toadied before Yagoda only because they know, to have Yagoda against yourself is at least a prison, and maybe even death, as the fugitive security officer Agabkov says in his book. On a good stone, Stalin tasted Yagoda. Yagoda is a completely Stalinist lackey. A person who had the opportunity to observe these caricatures in the Kremlin says that it is enough for Stalin to direct his delighted gaze at Yagoda for him to rush about under the gaze of the dictator. But Yagoda is not only a good executioner, he is a skilled courtier. He knows by himself that ambition is boundless, vanity is unsatisfied. And if Stalin tacitly allows himself to be glorified as a genius, thinker, philosopher, the most outstanding person in Europe. Then Yagoda proposed adding to this glorification a brilliant builder. History is a terrible tale told by a fool. Tyrants from ancient to modern are sick with the same boring disease, megalomania and, in particular, structures. In 1929, after the birth of Christ, the all-powerful head of the GPU, Yagoda, came to Stalin with a remarkable idea to begin the gigantic construction of artificial waterways. The pharmacist also submitted a project written by the engineers imprisoned in his cellars, to dig a canal 227 kilometers long, cut Karelia from Lake Onega to the White Sea, connecting the Baltic with the waters of the north, so that this canal was the first even of the Stalinist program for the reconstruction of the waterways of the Union. Yagoda is very modest, almost shy. He takes only patronage over the digging of the Stalinist canal. But he will dig it cheaply, without cars, without some necessary devices in Europe. It will dig in Egyptian with the muscles of the hungry, ragged prisoners driven from the concentration camps, 
turned by him into real slaves. The idea of a cheap reconstruction of the tracks was approved by Stalin. Work has begun. As overseers, Yagoda sent six Czechist Frankel, Firin, Berman, Kagan, Ripoport, Zhek, who gained well-deserved fame, whom, according to the story of the Czechist overseer Firin, he admonished in his office as follows. If in the camps you come across a stubborn unwillingness of entire groups of prisoners to follow the path of our work, then you, the Czechists, will be to blame for this. Do not trust anyone. The canal is being built on the initiative of Comrade Stalin. Every Czechist should remember this. And now, 200,000 hungry, ragged slaves driven from all over Russia are digging a canal, glorifying the name of Stalin through the ages. Slaves are dying. But is it worth thinking about it? Are people immortal? In addition, Slaves are called class enemies. And Yagoda sends telegrams to the Czechist overseers, higher pace. Ensure high quality facilities. Slaves are dying. But who cares about these deaths? What does Yagoda care about these people? He promised Stalin to dig a canal. And telegrams flew to the construction site. The progress of work, despite the measures taken, requires additional measures. Delays in the completion of construction cannot and will not be allowed. The canal must be completed by May 1st. I order, the entire Czechist apparatus bring the camps into a state of combat by creating combat headquarters headed by strong Czechists. Headquarters have been created. Shootings are coming. But exactly by May 1st, the channel is over. And Stalin and Yagoda went down in history as cultural traders of the Russian state. Yagoda and all six Czechist overseers were even awarded the Order of Lenin. Portraits of Yagoda filled all the newspapers of the USSR. Stalin and Yagoda are already sailing along the newly opened White Sea Baltic Canal, created on the bones of tens of thousands of slaves. The official description of the trip is solemn. The Anakin steamer cuts the waters of the White Sea Canal. On the deck are Stalin. Vershilov, Kirov and several Czechists, headed by Comrade Yagoda. The steamer is somehow crowded in a special way. Exclamations are heard. A lively conversation. Easy Stalin stands leaning on the railing. Allow me to introduce you to the leaders of Belomorstoy. Very glad. Stalin replies. Congratulations on your order. Yagoda addresses the prison engineer. Yagoda jokes. Laughs. The ship is sailing. Deck. Wicker chairs. Stalin and Yagoda are talking. The deck is swaying gently. Why shouldn't Yagoda joke and laugh? Together with the dictator, he is the most powerful person on one-sixth of the earth. True. All the high water of the seas connected by the canal is not able to wash his hands of blood, but he does not care. Paris. 1935.